chapter two. So I hope everyone is here. Um, okay, uh, thank you so much for uh, having me um, at, at the seminar. So um, um, my name is Razvan Pashkano. I'm a research scientist at DeepMind. And um, I wanted to talk about um, continual learning or more specifically how we've been recently thinking about continual learning. Um, and um, the talk is based on a recent review that, that we've done um, together with uh, Raya, Dushant, and Andre. Um, so the first, uh, the starting point of all of this discussion is the motivation for why would we care about continual learning? Um, and I'll start by giving you like a typical, um, the, the typical motivation that it's used in the, in the community. So, um, I guess that the starting point of all of this is the, is the observation that the world is not stationary. Um, so when we are building um, these machine learning systems that we use day to day, they're usually meant for a fixed data set, so a fixed domain and um, um, yeah, where you can observe all the data. So the data set is static. Um, and, and then you, you train the system on, on this uh, data and you get a particular performance. But this is uh, um, not typically true in practice. So in health, in robotics, in language, things tend to evolve over time. So language keeps changing from month to month. Like, um, uh, you know, we have new terms coming up um, like COVID who before, uh, before the pandemic, the word didn't necessarily exist and now kind of dominates all the news and all the the, the text that you could uh, scrap online. Um, and this is in contradiction with how deep learning models are typically built and thought of. So uh, deep learning models are powerful because they can scale easily and they can um, work well with large amounts of data. Um, but to do this, um, they're typically trained end to end using um, gradient based optimization which requires the data to be IID um, and, and requires sort of that you have uh, to, to you, you get to see all the data distribution at once um, and you can sample from it IID in order to, to learn. Um, this is not really how we typically learn. Uh, so if you try to contrast how machine learning systems work versus humans, um, like for us, it's actually the other way around. It's impossible for us to learn uh, from data that is IID. So imagine that you are trying to learn biology and, and instead of going through the uh, biology book, you actually randomly sample pages out of that book. And it would be really hard to make sense of what you're reading. Um, and this gets even worse if, you, if you're thinking of like uh, multiple topics. Um, so then the question is, um, why do humans learn the way they do compared to machines? And what could we gain if we enable uh, um, artificial systems to learn sequentially as well? Um, and the typical list of um, outcomes that one can ex uh, expect from a system that is able to learn sequentially um, is that we'll get um, uh, systems that can deal better with tasks that are continuously changing. Um, so as I mentioned before, language keeps evolving. So if you have a deployed uh, language system or chatbot, you'd want it to be able to keep track of the change in the data distribution. Um, robots are required to um, add skills over time to, be, to, you know, to, to interact with the world um, and, and to uh, gain more skills and compose the skills that it has. Um, if we're thinking in more ambitious terms, um, it has been argued before that um, artificial intelligence or AGI uh, needs to be able to learn continuously. So it is a, a requirement in, in the definition of, um, of an artificial system if it is to achieve something similar to human level intelligence. Um, and the last point is that one can actually hope um, that by um, enabling us to learn sequentially, we can achieve much more efficient learning and deep learning in general, even if we're not forced to work in a non-stationary setting. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the fourth point because um, uh, that's something we're trying to build on in, in this particular review. Um, and I wanted to give another kind of argument to think about um, the reason of why it's important to learn on the fly. Um, and, and this comes from thinking about the goal of machine learning systems in general. Um, and I would argue that uh, 
at least at the intuitive uh, level, when we're thinking about machine learnings and we're thinking about the tools that we're building and what they're meant for, what we're trying to do is to solve problems um, for which a data set is just a particular instance of that problem. So what we have access to, for example, is the ImageNet data set that we're trying to fit at the moment. But what we really want to do is we want to build a system that's able to recognize images. Um, so for us, ImageNet itself, the, the particular data set is not of importance. The, the most important bit is actually the task itself, right? So what we care about is to have the system that is able to recognize dogs from cats, not necessarily to recognize ImageNet dogs versus ImageNet cats. Um, and, and this kind of forces machine learning to um, at least aspire to move into uncharted territories where the goal is actually, um, I guess what people would call out of distribution generalization. So the goal is to have this system that is presented with a static data set that is learning something specific. Um, and then afterwards for it to be able to perform on data that is of the same type, but not necessarily from the same distribution. And um, I'm saying this is uncertain territory because while um, out of distribution generalization has become recently um, quite an important topic where people talk about it left and right, I still feel that um, the formalism um, of it, it's kind of lacking behind. So we, most of the time I feel that when people talk about out of distribution generalization, there's nothing really specific in mind besides sort of the intuitive understanding of what it's supposed to mean. Um, um, and, and from this perspective, I guess the argument that I want to make is that for a system, if, if we're talking about out of distribution generalization in a, in a generic sense, in the intuitive sense that we might want um, our system to behave, um, where we don't have like a, a specific transformation of the data that we care about, where it's not like a pre-constructed form of uh, generalization where we say, well, there's this particular invariance that I want to exploit and I want the system to be aware of it, where you don't know this invariance beforehand, I would argue that one of the main tools that we might have to deal with this is to have a system that's able to learn on the fly. Um, so a system that's able to learn efficiently and continuously might give us sort of um, what we intuitively think about um, as, as out of distribution generalization, might give us a system that, you know, it's able to um, work on data of the same type, uh, building on what it's seen before and sort of at the same time learning from every example that it says, uh, that, that, that it sees. Um, and um, just to kind of build on this, um, I guess if you're thinking about uh, human intelligence, and I really like this work from Thomas Griffins, um, where he's trying to look at, um, uh, he's trying to compare human intelligence versus um, artificial intelligence. Um, there is a hypothesis there that actually uh, human intelligence has the form it has because of its limitation. And I think this is a, a, a typical, um, uh, hypothesis that it's um, um, uh, a typical hypothesis from uh, cognitive science. science. Um, so the idea is that, um, for example, we believe that that human thinking is has a compositional compositional form. So the way we're thinking and we're reasoning about the object is in this sort of co compositional fashion. Um, and the reason for this might be because of the of the restrictions that we have as humans, right? So like the the amount of compute that we can do in a in an amount in, in a given um, time frame, um, and 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 potentially the style of learning that we have, sort of the learning that is uh, sequential that we do, comes from the same restrictions. Um, and um, the, the 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 thinking here is that if you want a machine learning system to behave. Um, an intelligence system to behave similar to how human intelligence behaves, we need to include in our thinking sort of the limitations that um, a human system needs to deal with, um, and we need to reason about it. And we need to build ML systems that are aware of the limitations that they have and that they can exploit this limitation. So I guess part of the hypothesis is that trying to brute force us to learn a system that will be able to generalize to out of distribution data to data that is different from the one observed uh, is potentially hopeless. 
And, and sort of this idea that out of distribution generalization will just come from large amounts of data or from some unknown source um, is probably um, unreliable and potentially a much more um, efficient way of thinking of this problem and thinking of how we can move from one data set to um, like real world and a continuous stream of data is to think about systems that are able to uh, learn very efficiently on the fly. Um, and the systems will be phased to a bounded compute um, per, per second or per observations. Um, and they might need to make implicit and explicit trade-offs of, of how to deal with this. Um, and um, continual learning, I guess, in an implicit way is actually trying to look at this problem. So continual learning is trying to address the question of how can you learn efficiently in a, in a continuous uh, um, non-stationary stream of data. Um, and we'd argue that, you know, we should think of this not only as, a, as an issue that, we, that has to be dealt with, um, you know, something that we need to overcome, um, but um, as I'll explain later, that it might actually be advantages to this uh, particular protocol of learning and dealing with the system. And we should also think about how we can exploit these limitations. Um, yeah, and in, in particular, I guess um, uh, this is a bit sort of off topic, but I wanted to highlight that, you know, uh, what comes of, of thinking of the problem of thinking about learning on the fly and thinking about efficient learning is that um, an objective that we might care about when we're learning the systems is how efficiently can we extract information from the observation that we have. And this is partially what continual learning is trying to do as well. It's trying to come up with learning algorithms that are able to extract information quite efficiently and retain the information that they had before. Um, and um, yeah, I believe that in, in general, in, in deep learning and machine learning, we tend to focus on performance as a metric without necessarily paying sufficient attention of like the cost of learning and maybe the cost of doing inference in that systems um, and the cost of the hard coded uh, knowledge that has been added to the system. Um, but ideally what we really care if we want to, to obtain a system that is able to learn on the fly very efficiently, we want to fold all of those things in our objective. I mean, this might, the, the formula, the specific formula that I've put on the slide makes probably no sense. And it's just sort of, uh, just a kind of a high level idea of like how I was thinking about this. But um, the point is that is important for us to make some of this uh, hidden or implicit trade-offs that we're making, it's important to make them explicit and to, to measure them in order to have an understanding and, and the ability to compare between systems and understand how they would uh, behave in practice. Uh, because if we focus just on the performance in a um, kind of in vitro setting where we don't actually look at the cost of training and, and everything else, we might be doing the wrong kind of trade-offs. Um, cool. So I, I forgot to mention, but like if anyone has questions, feel free to, to interrupt me. I'm, I'm happy to, to discuss this further at, at the end of the talk, but yeah, if, if there are questions now that would help clarify what I'm trying to say, um, I'm, I'm happy to be uh, interrupted. So I wanted to move from, so this is sort of the high level motivation for continual learning. So uh, the motivation is the world is non-stationary, so we need to deal with it. If we want to deploy systems in the real world, they need to deal with the non-stationary problem. And um, learning on the fly, being able to learn very efficiently from data that it hasn't been pre-processed beforehand and, and made it to be IID um, could be an important tool for us to um, expand from solving a single data set and moving towards uh, learning a system that is able to generalize and auto-distribution data where generalization in this, um, in this view becomes more um, just sort of the ability to learn online uh, every example that you have and extract information very quickly from it um, and, and therefore being able to track sort of the, the distribution as it, as it is presented to you. Um, and that gives you a form of, 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 of generalization or, or being performant on the, on the continuous stream of data. Um, so the next step I wanted to go through like the, the definition of continual learning, the way it's been used in the field and sort of trying to connect this back to the motivations that I, that I was just presenting and sort of the, the high level view that we had on what continual learning is. Um, 
So in general, continual learning is not is mostly defined as a as a list of it's defined as a protocol of how you should train your system and what they should have access to and not, um, and a list of desiderata that you'd expect from the solution of of the learning system that is faced with this protocol. Um, and the protocol it, it, it's actually not very fixed. So there's a lot of, um, of, of little things that you can change and you can get different variations of continual learning problems. So usually it relies on the concept of, of a task, which uh, I mean, that's a whole new discussion of what the task is and what is not. But assuming that you have some way of partitioning your, your data into tasks where um, each task you can think of it as a static distribution, um, then the system needs to go through these tasks one after the other sequentially and learn them one after the other. And you'd want, um, and, and then there are like different choices that you can have. So these transitions can be discrete or smooth. So you could jump from one task to another, or they could be just a smooth transition uh, where the distribution slowly changes. Um, you have the choice of the type of tasks. You know, this, the task can be all of the same um, of the same type. They could be either supervised problems. They could be RL problems. Um, they could even be a mix of them. Um, and you might not even have well-defined tasks, or you might or might not have access to the task IDs or the task boundaries. And all of this defines sort of the different variants of protocols that you can encounter in the literature. Um, and then you have the list of desiderata of what the system is supposed to do. Uh, so the system is supposed to be able to learn all of these tasks that you go through one after the other, um, where you have minimal access to what you've seen in the past. Um, and this is usually done in order to sort of mimic the limitation of what uh, a realistic um, system might have in the real world where time is irreversible. So there's no exact way of, of going back in the data. Um, and then there's sort of um, all kinds of potential constraints that you have in terms of how much data you can store from your past and how quickly you can go and revisit, um, revisit it. Um, the other thing is, um, the other typical constraint that people impose on this learning systems have to do with the model capacity or the amount of computation. Um, so usually this is uh, phrased as the model should not increase in capacity as you go from one task to another. So this at least should not be linear, should be sublinear, how the capacity increases. And also the amount of compute should not increase. Um, and usually the amount of compute is a little bit harder to, to track and to measure. So people kind of rely on capacity and capacity usually ends up being um, sort of around the amount of data you can store or basically just memory, which is not necessarily the um, resource that we're mostly constrained. I think compute, it's a lot more important, but it's typically harder to deal with. Um, and you want systems that are fast at ad adapting and recovering sort of the, the solutions that it's in. So you'd want to, whenever you learn a new task, you want to learn it faster and faster. So you want to build on the knowledge that you've acquired so far so that you can learn faster. And you also, when you revisit the task, you either want to remember the solution. So you want to be able to act optimally in that previous task, or you want to be able to quickly recover the performance that you had. Um, and then, you, you know, like measuring all of these things gives you different kind of metrics that you might care about. So one of it is catastrophic forgetting, which is depicted here, which usually refers to the performance that you get on a previous scene task. And, um, you know, the plot shows, you know, you've reached a particular performance for task one, but as soon as you start learning task two, that performance drops considerably. And this is considered catastrophic forgetting. And to a, a big extent is the main focus of a lot of the published work in the, in the field. So people tend to, prioritize catastrophic forgetting as one of the main issues with, with continual learning. Um, another potential problem um, that, that people have started to look at it uh, a bit more seriously recently, it's around maintaining plasticity. And, and this can, can have two flavors of it. So one is the ability to generalize. Um, so there has been recent observation that as you learn one task after the other, the, per, the optimal performance that you can get on, on um, the later tasks, like task two or three, is much lower than what you would have uh, obtained if you'd start from like a fresh initialization. Uh, so it seems that as you learn, you lose the ability to generalize or you lose the ability to learn um, as well as you used to do before. Um, and another way of thinking about it is more in terms of uh, data efficiency. So you might reach the same performance, but you might be learning much slower. 
Um, um, and you have forward and backwards transfer. So this is again um, uh, connected to the to the plasticity question, but this is more about like how quickly and uh, how um, much better are you going to learn the new tasks, given that you've seen the previous tasks. So um, you know the if if for example um, previous tasks might give you useful features that it's really hard for you to recover from the data that you have on the new task. So this can help you boost your final performance. Uh, so the before transfer and backwards transfer is um, basically as as you learn a new task, if there is a, any relationship between the new task and one of the previous tasks that you've learned in the past, um, by learning the new task, do you improve on the previous task? Uh, which is also something that that humans do, right? So it doesn't necessarily uh, matter the the chronological order in which you visit the tasks. If two tasks are correlated, um, you know by learning both of them, you improve you know, by learning one improves on the other, regardless of the of the chronological order. So this is kind of the backward and forward transfer. So you'd expect um, learning the new task to also affect previous tasks and actually help you perform better as, as you've learned um, like new aspects of the of the data. Um, and the, the issue with this kind of definition is first of all, you don't have and, and this is something that you know you typically have in machine learning and it's sort of something that people typically focus on. Um, you don't have one number to optimize, which makes th things really hard, right? So it's really hard to say, okay, I want to evaluate all the continual learning systems that I have. And th there is one number and I can sort them and I can tell which one is doing better than the other. What you have is you have multiple objectives. Um, and these objectives are competing with each other. Um, so for example, you know, like the, um, if, if you, if you focus on catastrophic forgetting and perfect recall, which is something that people have done in the past, um, it's really easy to trade off all the other properties like fixed capacity and, and so on in order to solve this problem. Uh, forward transfer and catastrophic forgetting seem to be opposing each other more often than not. So whenever you have a system that does better in terms of not forgetting, it does so by paying a huge cost in terms of how quickly it learns new things and so forth. And, um, and this makes it really hard because we don't really have an understanding of what is the um, what is it that we exactly want? Like if we, if I want to have all of these objectives and say I have a way of quantifying them, can I come up with a weighted sum of them that would give me the objective to minimize? And we don't have those weights, right? So those weights are unknown and those weights might change from task to task. So it, it, they, they are domain specific. So in certain domains, for example, um, catastrophic forgetting dominates um, the learning uh, dynamics of a, of a sequential learning system. And then it's sort of more important to pay attention to that. While in other uh, settings, catastrophe forgetting might be less important. So this this creates sort of uh, a lot of confusion and a lot of uh, flexibility in the field, <laughs> where it's kind of uh, you know depending on the angle and and the sort of the formulation of the protocol and everything, it's really easy to to construct all of this. Um, uh, different variants of continual learning problems and makes it really hard to compare algorithms between them. Um, and um, yeah, I think I think this is sort of something that the continual learning community is still struggling with. Um, potentially like one way of, of getting out of this dilemma is to come up with uh, benchmarks that we care about um, and sort of let the data speak in terms of the trade-offs that we want to do between these this different uh, ones. But um, I don't think as a community we're there yet. I, I feel like uh, basically we're still sort of in a space where we're building different variants of the problem that impose different trade-offs that kind of highlights different algorithmical changes that we want to propose in the papers that we, that we write. Um, nonetheless, even if we don't know exactly what is the balance that we need, it, um, it is sort of still a very important problem and um, the protocol and, and the metrics that we have, they're still quite useful, at least for us to understand how we're doing um, on, on sort of in this particular setting. Um, so you can, you can look at it both ways. So the protocol gives you the flexibility to ask the questions that are most important for, uh, for you. Um, it also makes it really hard to understand sort of how much progress we've made in the field um, and uh, how models and, and architectures do compare between each other. Um, I wanted to give you another way of thinking about continual learning um, um, 
more from from an optimization perspective and argue why continual learning like is so important. Basically, it connects sort of the, the continual learning uh, problem and, and learning in an IID setting with the typical deep learning problem and, and sort of what the impact would, would have on, on a typical learning setting. Um, and for this, I make a small detour and just talk a little bit about learning dynamics in a, in a typical uh, uh, setting. Um, so gradient-based optimization, um, it is sort of the, the, the workhorse of everything that we do. Um, and it's been, it's been sort of how we've been training neural nets for the last four decades or more. Um, and then the, the, it, it is sort of, however, important from time to time to think exactly sort of how gradient descent works and to have sort of a deeper understanding of the implications um, that comes with it. Um, so for example, if we're thinking about um, how, how uh, uh, gradient descent works, you can look at each training example. Each training example gives you a gradient, which tells you, so the gradient basically looks at each weight in, in independently and asks, okay, what would happen if I increase this weight Would the loss increase or decrease? Um, so it gives you like a sense in like which direction each weight should move. Um, and you do this independently, ignoring all the other weights, right? Because it's, uh... and then when you have a mini batch, what you do is for each example, in parallel, you're asking the same question, you know, for, for you pick a weight and for that weight for each example, you ask, you know, should this weight increase, should this weight decrease in order for my loss to, 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 um, to get smaller. Um, and once you have all of these answers, you sum them. Um, and you can think of this sum as basically, you can think of each example as voting in which direction the weight should move. And, and the sum is, is sort of taking all of these votes into account. So, um, I guess the image that I'm trying to create here, the, the way I'm thinking about sort of the learning dynamics at this level, is you can think of it as a tug of war, where each example is pulling of the weight, either to increase or decrease, depending on how the loss would behave, right? Um, and the way learning happens is you enact this tug of war games on each independent weight in the, in the network. Uh, so each example is doing this. Um, and then the solution that you come up is basically the equilibrium of all of these games that are being played in parallel. So everyone is pulling on the rope uh, towards them and then at some point you reach an equilibrium and that gives you the solution, which is the, the, the model that you want. Uh, so why is this important? Um, basically the tug of war dynamics um, is what enforces um, or requires for the data to be IID. So in order for the tug of war game to work in an ideal world, you would have all of the examples at the same time, they're pulling on the rope and then you find the equilibrium based on uh, you know, all of these forces. Um, a way to make this more tractable is instead of having all the data at the same time, we sample it. But in order for, um, you know, for you to still play the same game in expectation, um, you need to sample things in an IID fashion, right? You need to, uh, independent, yeah, and, and this is sort of where the IID comes from. Now, um, imagine that you have, um, I guess, two tasks, and sort of what would happen um, if you if you play this task sequentially, and then what would happen is, sorry, do I have the? Okay, what would happen when you play this uh, this game sequentially is that because of the sequentiality. Well, the, the examples of task uh, one that were pulling on the rope for you to get equilibrium. So when you learn multitask, what happens is you have the data of task one and the data of task two, they're both pulling on the rope in this tug of war game. And, and then you reach this equilibrium and you can see this on the, on the third plot, you can see sort of how the gradients of the different uh, tasks, some pull, pull you left, the other one right, and you kind of reach this equilibrium which gives you the solution of both tasks. Now, if you don't have both forces at the same time, so if you learn things sequentially, when you're learning task two, you don't have the, 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 the force representing task one that was forcing you to pulling the rope toward, uh, towards left, right? And because of that, what happens is task two is able to pull the weights all the way uh, to the right and just sort of to represent the data that it has and you have catastrophic forgetting. So all the data of, of, of um, like the, the task one is, is being forgotten, is being um, lost because of this, right? Because you don't have this force to enact it. Now, um, you said to interrupt if I had questions. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so if you go back to that picture with the two tasks with catastrophic forgetting, um, is this kind of uh, behavior with two different tasks, uh, is it 
to me, this looks like something that's only true in dimension two. Um, and in particular, that's false if it's in if you're working with a network in sufficiently high dimension. Um, because if you imagine a very high, a, a network with a large amount of parameters and you imagine two tasks, then if the amount of parameters is large enough, then there will be a subnetwork within the network that can solve task one perfectly, and there will be a subnetwork that can solve task two perfectly. And so in principle, uh, it's not the case that the perfect parameter would be somewhere in between the tasks, and it's probably more accurate thinking from high dimension projected back into low dimension to think of it as being in both locations at the same time. So I'm curious like whether the intuition basically still applies if, I, if I'm making any sense with that comment. Yeah, um, I, I think your, your intuition applies potentially in the limit. Um, so in particular, if you're thinking of, uh, so what happens in the limit as the model size goes to infinity, um, I mean, things become in some sense trivial like, uh, as, as you go to infinity, what happens is that you're not learning anymore um, because sort of your system behaves like a random projection and you kind of just learn the output layer and then- Well, that's, um, that's, like that's, that, that, that's generically not true. That's not generically true. It depends on how you parameterize the weights. It depends on your training process. It depends on a lot of things. Like it's, it's not true that gradient descent doesn't do anything when the thing goes in the limit. That's only true, that's only true in, in very spe in specific cases and actually not the cases you'd want to use probably. It's it's true for a, for a deep network. Um, Not if, generically, if it depends on how you parameterize your weights, and it depends on the details of your training procedure. Sure, but maybe okay. Um, I guess the I, I think what happens is this this game is get is being enacted regardless of the model size in some sense, just because the gradient looks independently at each parameter. So while there are sub networks, as you said. When you're trying to do gradient descent, you're not, you don't have sort of this global view, right? You're, you're asking the same question for each weight. So while, um, which means that like any weight, you know, if you move it left or right would have an impact for the task that it has, unless you have a particular initialization that somehow already disconnected some networks in your model and there's no impact on, on the output. I see, so basically because of the, unless you have the disentanglement you're still gonna, you're still yeah. gonna potentially get something like this, and so essentially, th th then this is related to disentanglement. Okay, very, very nice. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, so it happens, and with the random projection, I, I mean, I like maybe that's sort of a different discussion, but that was sort of my understanding of like the argument that Belkin is trying to make, which is as the model size grows, learning tends to stay closer and closer. I mean, potentially, it's not true in in the in the sense that weights don't change, but like. We do know that as the model size grows, the change of, of the parameters becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's usually if you, there have been studies that looked at different layers and you can see that most of the change usually happens in the top layers and bottom layers tend to stay closer and closer to where they were when you started. So yeah, but I, but I, yeah, I, I agree with you that maybe there, there's like a lot of details and yeah, but anyway. Uh, but yeah, so this is sort of, I, I think the, in here sort of this game happens is because you're looking independently at each weight and then you basically for each weight you're asking this problem yeah because it's independent then you you, you have this kind of issues and because of the how, how the model is initialized and, and parameterized um so i guess the point that i wanted to make related to this um tug of war dynamics so um and and sort of how how this probably connects with typical learning in, in, in a machine learning system, in a deep learning system, is that um, what you notice when you just train in a, in a typical fashion with IID data is that you actually need to do multiple repetitions of, of the data set, right? Um, so um, even though, um, yeah, so, so it's not enough to see one data point once and you kind of learn it, even if it's sample ID or it doesn't matter how the data is presented, you actually have to go through multiple um, repetitions through the data set in order for you to converge to an optimal uh, performance. Um, and then we also know that all the examples in the data set, they don't have the same difficulty. Uh, so um, there's been work, I mean, this, this, like Schmidt Huber had long time ago work on this, but there's been several works in this space that sort of look at how fast you learn different examples in your data set. And you usually notice this sort of bimodal distribution where there's always a big chunk of your data that is learned really fast. 
and a chunk that uh, those are the hard examples where you actually need to repeat many, many times. Um, and the what the sort of tug of war uh, dynamics here, what it kind of um, enforces is for you to visit all of the examples. Um, and and um, yeah, I mean, there, there are works that looked at this. Um, so like, um, where basically people, what they try to do is they try to subsample the data set. So they, they try to, um, you know, you go once through a data set, they try to identify those examples that were already learned and then kind of focus learning on the hard examples so that you uh, gain some computational uh, efficiency. Um, and this kind of, I mean, this kind of approaches, they don't tend to work. So th there are a few papers that are trying to go in this direction and usually they're forced to introduce all kinds of regularization terms that force uh, to, to help you um, be able to converge to the same solution, um, but they don't, they're not mainstream. And the reason they're not is because they don't tend, they, they tend to be finicky. Um, and those kind of regularization terms that they add, they basically, you can match them one-to-one -one with different continual learning uh, uh, solutions. So they're basically treating the problem as a, as a continual learning problem, uh, sort of implicitly in order to come up uh, with that. Um, so, so basically the tug of war dynamics makes learning inefficient because even though uh, you've learned some part, some mode of your data distribution, you still need to revisit it. You still need to compute gradients on it um, until you've converged. Um, and, and this is potentially one reason why deep learning systems are so data inefficient or like so computationally inefficient. I, there are two aspects of it. So one is data inefficiency. The other one is computational inefficiency. And I guess this is more about the computational inefficiency. So why the systems need to go over the same data over and over again. Um, and yeah, I guess I wanted to highlight that there are works that looked at this. So like in ImageNet, people have done this. There is some also more interesting work uh, from, from Tom Scholl um, that's called the Ray Hypothesis, where um, it looks at like learning dynamics when you try to learn multiple tasks uh, simultaneously in multitask, uh, sort of in a multitask scenario, and observes that actually more often than not, you end up learning this task in a sequential manner. So even though both, all the tasks are presented to you at the same time, if you look at the performance on a different task, this tends to, you tend to this first solve one task and then the other and so forth. But regardless, you know, the way you've, you've solved the task, you still have to see all of them all the time because of the, because of the uh, tag over dynamics. So it's not as if you, because I've learned task one, I can remove it from my multitask objective and just focus on the other ones. I still have to uh, rehearse it. Granted, there are some uh, tricks that you can do, so you can potentially reduce a little bit the weight of the task that's been solved, but um, and in you know the big picture, you still have to go through all of them all the time. Um, and, and this happens even if the tasks have the same difficulty. So even if the tasks have the same form, it, it seems like because of the initialization and sort of how this learning dynamics works, um, and you know, deep nets tend to focus on one of the of, of the task first, and then follow the other. And this is also connected to um, the work from Andrew Sachs on deep linear system, like um, uh, um, where he makes similar kind of observations that um, when you have this deep linear system that you are trying to uh, do some aggression with them, they seem to um, cover different modes of the data in sort of in a sequential manner. Um, um, so um, basically, you know, tug of war is is or I like yeah. So this this phenomenon that I've tagged that I've uh, uh, branded as, as tug of war dynamics, um, it's, it's something that happens due sort of to, to gradient descent, which is sort of the workhorse of, of deep learning, and it has the potential of making or it might be one of the sources for why deep learning is computationally inefficient. So. Um, if we find a way of, of learning um, that avoids this kind of dynamics, that solves the credit assignment problem differently. So the tug of war here is mostly about sort of how you do credit assignment within the neural net. How do you decide which weights are supposed to learn which part of the data to represent which features? Um, if we find a way of dealing with this credit assignment problem, if we find a way of doing this credit assignment that doesn't involve this tug of war dynamics, then we have the potential to increase learning efficiency um, considerably. Um, and it will also, at the same time, and I guess this is sort of the connection of continual learning, that's sort of what continual learning wants to do as well, because that's sort of the issue why you can't learn sequentially. It's again, because you need to have all the examples here in order to, to enact sort of this um, tug over dynamics. So 
basically um, what I wanted to do here is trying to rephrase a little bit. So continual learning was presented as a, as a set of protocols and a set of desiderata that you might have from a system. But another way of thinking about it is just um, it's, it's trying to address sort of how credit assignment is being done within the neural net. And it asks the question of whether there are alternative mechanisms of doing this credit assignment within the neural net of discover, discovering which weights are supposed to model which part of the data um, in such a way that it doesn't require um, sort of the data to be presented by ID in, in such a way that allows sequentiality. Um, and if we, if we manage to do this, then we might be able to exploit sort of um, this kind of um, observation that the data usually has, you know, sim simple examples and hard examples, and it might allow us to be computationally more efficient, at least by not forcing us to repeat things that we've already learned uh, as, as we're trying to find uh, a solution of, on, the, on the stationary data set. So, and, and this has an impact, I guess this was the point of, of this little section, is that this might have a, an impact even if you think of the traditional deep learning setting. Um, so even if you ignore sort of um, all of these things about like the world being non-stationary non and that we need to come up with solutions that are able to learn online and all of this, um, there's still value of trying to figure out how to learn sequentially because it might even help us in, in typical settings that you know, we, we use day to day. Um, and then, okay, just wanted to give a quick uh, view of the, of the landscape of the continual learning solutions that we have so far. Um, so just, you know, it's really hard. So this, like the, the field has been exploded in, exploding in the last few years. So there's more and more people coming into the field and there's lots of papers um, appearing um, at every, every conference. So it's a bit hard to keep track of everything. And it's also really hard to, to split all of these works into like very strict categories. So there's a bunch of families of approaches and I'm just gonna talk about the, 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 the big uh, few families of approaches that are out there, but um, it's more like a continuum rather than like a, a, di a discrete clustering where it's kind of really easy to go from one type of approach to another uh, sort of in a continuous fashion. Um, but at large sort of to get like a, a feeling of how people have approached this. Oh, and the other point I wanted to make is obviously continual learning is, is, is super related to like a bunch of other subfields that are also quite big and, and, and quite popular from, from like transfer learning to meta learning to online learning and to um, yeah, all of these things that they're sort of tightly uh, connected to each other. Um, even though sometimes people don't always, yeah, they don't really acknowledge this all the time. So they kind of reinvent or like report solutions from one subfield to another um, and, and kind of making them look independent. Um, so one family of approaches, um, which is, tends to be pretty big. Um, and um, it's, it's what I would refer to as regularization based solutions. So um, this is where sort of most of the Bayesian solutions to continual learning um, I, where I put most of the Bayesian solutions to continual learning as well. Um, and what this thing, what, what this family of methods tend to do is they tend to use the uh, um, multitask objective as the ground truth of what you'd actually would want. And they try to come up with some regularization term that approximates all the parts of the data that you don't have. So if you think of the tag of word dynamics, they, what they're basically trying to do is they're trying to introduce a regularization term that would act as that force that now will be missing because you don't have the data anymore. And there's different way of, of, of doing this. So you, you, know, you can look at this from a Bayesian perspective. You can think of this from like a Taylor series expansion and there are different kinds of approximations that have been used in the literature. But, but by and large, this is sort of, uh, in my mind, the philosophy that happens within this family of approaches. Um, and here, I guess one thing that I wanted to highlight is that um, and, and this is something I said before, the emphasis is on catastrophic forgetting. So the emphasis is in maintaining this tug over dynamics in, so that you don't forget those previous tasks that you've seen. Um, um, the other family of approaches, they tend to be sort of rehearsal based methods or memory based methods. And they are sort of very similar to the regularization one at large scale. What they're trying to do is they're trying to mimic the multi, uh, multi-task objective and they do so through rehearsal. So they store either data or compressed form of the data that you can use to uh, rehearse in order to recover sort of the, the uh, gradients or to recover the objective of the task that you don't have access to um, 
I guess one one difference that I would make here, um, though again, as I said, it's, it can be ported to the other family as well, is this memory-based methods, they can also be a little bit more uh, local. So one question that you can have is what happens when you have a sequence of tasks for which there exists no multitask solution, like two tasks are opposing each other, they're doing exactly the opposite of each other. So then if you try to phrase this as a multitask objective that you try to minimize, then the solution of that multitask solution uh, of that multitask objective might not be useful for you. So you, but if you if you see that they are sequentially, there's still sort of some kind of optimal behavior that you can expect where you're just trying to fit the local context. And um, uh, there's been work in the memory-based solutions for continual learning that accommodate for that scenario where the, the multitask objective is not as informative as it should be. Um, and I guess the last family of, of methods, uh, it, it, it sort of rely on modularity or sparsity where they basically try to find these sub-modules and they try to enforce them. So they try to um, project the gradients or they try to um, separate different modules within your architecture in such a way that there's no interference between them. Um, and just, okay, I still have a few minutes. So I wanted to wrap it up talking about, okay, so we have the solutions and then I wanted to talk a little bit about benchmarks and, and sort of try to draw some conclusion based on that. So um, continual learning uh, domain at the moment is, is sort of dominated on like several sort of toyish tasks like the permitted amnesty and sort of split variants of amnesty fire, uh, omniglot, SDHN, image, image net and so forth, which are usually just taking a traditional um, classification task. Um, and they try to make tasks out of it, either by splitting according to classes or by doing some transformations of the input and so forth. Um, and there's been a little bit of work in RL as well, but usually in RL, like um, tasks are either too hard and, and, and not that popular, or they tend to be easy enough that they kind of are similar to the supervised one. Um, and, the, and the issue with this is that this task, they don't necessarily um, they're not necessarily meaningful. So the trade-offs that you're forced to make in order to solve an Atari game. So for example, in an Atari game, it's not always clear what is the transfer that you'd expect from like breakout to Space Invader. So if you have breakout and Space Invader in your, in your sequence, it's not clear what you'd expect to learn from one to the other. Um, so, so like if you want to ask questions about forward transfer, it's really hard to ask them. At most, you can ask questions about interference, which is what typically people do in continual learning. Um, and the same, same to a certain extent happens for the supervised tasks as well. Um, and then you, you also like tend to look at and you tend to use as an objective sort of the average score that you get on all the tasks at the end of training, which again, it's very tuned towards catastrophic forgetting because catastrophic forgetting would dominate this uh, to a big extent, right? Because you have, uh, if, you, if you look at the end of training, like you just have the last task where you could see for transfer how quickly you learn on the last task, but for all the previous ones, usually what uh, the performance on those tasks would reflect is how much you've forgotten uh, from the performance that you got when you learned those tasks. So these are the typical metric that we use. Um, and, and I think the, the issue here is that everything is biased towards catastrophic forgetting and it makes it really hard for us to solve um, continual learning. So in some sense, like, uh, and, and I think uh, this was sort of the point that we tried to make with this work that we called continual meta world. Um, in some sense, these solutions might not really solve the problem that we want. Uh, so here we proposed uh, a continual learning um, problem based on meta world. So I'm not gonna go over details. Um, I'm assuming many of you know the meta world uh, benchmark, which is this uh, robot manipulation task that was proposed uh, previously. So we just, this is set up as a meta learning task. So you have many subtasks or many sub man, uh, manipulation subtasks. And in the continual meta world, we just put them in a particular order. Um, and actually what we were looking for is we're trying to understand sort of the relationship between forgetting and, um, and poor transfer. Um, and the intuition was that you'd want to remember in order to be able to learn more efficiently. So if we go back to the tug of war, what you'd want to do is you'd want to remember the solution on the previous, on the, you want to remember the easy example, so you don't need to revisit them anymore. So you can actually be more data efficient. So you can, you know, you can actually learn computationally more efficient moving forward. And we wanted to understand whether there is any relationship about the amount of forgetting that we see 
and how fast we've learned and if, if we can correlate those things uh, more. Um, and, and for this, we, you know, we came up with some metrics that I'm not going to go into detail uh, of, but they kind of trying to measure sort of these different things. And what we did is we built the sequence by looking at a transfer or like similar, similarity kind of matrix, where we look to see how useful a task is to another. Um, and based on that, we created sequences of tasks where you have like this distractor tasks in the middle. So you can think of a sequence of three tasks where you know that one transfers to three, but like two doesn't transfers to three. And you ask the question, what happens if I put these two in the middle? Would I see, still see that transfer if I'm solving the kind of forgetting problem? If I remember one, when I start learning three, would I see the four transfer from, from remembering one? Um, and this is sort of the, the concept of, of this benchmark that we've recently proposed. Um, and, and there you can get sort of some kind of reference number of like what would be optimal, what you'd expect. Um, and I guess, um, uh, of obviously, as any benchmark has a lot of limitation, but I guess the punchline is um, that actually you see that most of the continual learning methods, they explicitly trade off the forward transfer for Karasovi forgetting. So no, you don't like the, the best forward transfer that you get is from a system that just fine tunes um, and that system doesn't remember one at all. <laughs> so if you have this one, two, three, where two is a distractor, like the best you can do is no, don't use any continual learning. If you only look at forward transfer, the best you can do is don't use any continual learning solution. Um, and then you get the maximal forward transfer. And that forward transfer is basically the forward transfer that you would have if you just train two, three without one at all. So you, you know, you're not anywhere close of the optimal or like reference where we should be remember one and reuse the features of one when you learn three. Um, and, and we set up this benchmark as just sort of like a, a limitation of how uh, we've been focusing only on, on catastrophic forgetting and sort of arguing that the reason we want to solve catastrophic forgetting is to enable this forward transfer. So it's to, to change sort of this credit assignment. Um, and, and yeah, I guess this benchmark is more meant as a uh, showing that it's sort of important to keep track of all of these things. And it's sort of very easy because of all the flexibility that we have in defining the protocols and the metrics and how we measure things, it's very easy to end up solving something different maybe from what you potentially were um, hoping to solve, um, which, uh, yeah, I guess for me would have been sort of the tug of war dynamics or, or sort of the how the credit assignment was done in the paper. So yeah, this conclusion kind of says the same thing. And yeah, I guess as a, as a summary uh, slide, um, yeah, I, I think, Learning sequentially is quite important for a various, uh, for, for many reasons, from the fact that the world is non-stationary, so real world systems will have to deal with this, to the fact that um, it might help us understand better how we do create the assignment within the neural net, and it might uh, enable us to learn a lot more efficiently in general. Um, and um, yeah, I think continual learning is a, a good framework to study this, um, it's still, maturing to a certain extent and there's still quite a lot of um, uh, it's still extremely flexible and there's a lot of freedom and it's very easy to kind of get things wrong in there um, and yeah I guess the last point is um, so far uh, like the premise of continual learning was that we would fix catastrophic forgetting in order to enable for a transfer um, and so far for all, most of the solutions that we have if not all the solutions that we have uh, we're not really achieving that. We kind of got stuck with uh, fixing the catastrophe forgetting, um, and we're doing that by paying a huge cost in terms of forward transfer. So we're not uh, seeing that forward transfer that we wanted. Um, cool. And yeah, I want to thank um, all my uh, collaborators. So um, those who helped sort of in this review that I wrote, so I mentioned the first slide, Raya, Andre Dushant and, and people who helped me work on that benchmark, um, so Maciej um, and so forth, uh, Maciej, Piotr and, and the others, but also in general, my colleagues and collaborators whose ideas kind of inspired many of these works. And um, thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions or discuss any questions.